on camera. Today's March 1st, 2019. We're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer at the History Center. And with me today is Ed Woods, who is also a volunteer at the History Center, and Sue Verhoff, who is the Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the Atlanta History Center. Uh, we're honored to have with us today Mr. Rick Marat. Uh, Mr. Marat is a Vietnam veteran, served in the U.S. Army, and has kindly agreed to come in and talk to us about his experiences as part of the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. We really appreciate you coming in today and look forward to hearing your story. All right. Would you give us your full name and the city and state where you currently live? Okay, I go by Rick, but my actual name is Frederick Kester Marat. Right. And I was born in Denver, Colorado, May 20th, 1947. Right. Uh, stayed in Colorado for uh, many years, but have lived here in Atlanta now for almost 25 years. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Okay. My uh, upbringing, probably the best starts with my parents. My parents uh, got married December 8, 1941, oh. which is the day before Pearl Harbor. Yeah. And uh, yeah. the next day, my dad went and signed up in the, the Army hmm. uh, to go to, to war and, and spent his time in the Army in the Pacific. Uh, my mom was a uh, Rosie the Riveter, went to uh, Boeing and helped make airplanes, and so they were very hmm. involved. Oh. And then uh, came back after the war and had me. And they ended up getting divorced when I was very, very young. And so uh, my mom raised me. Okay. She was a beautician, hairdresser, and my dad was a Denver policeman. Oh. I saw him every Saturday. My mom worked Saturdays, and so I spent Saturdays with my dad. So he had a, a big influence on my life okay. and was very service-oriented, serving as a policeman and uh, was very interested in me being in the military, so uh, he encouraged me to uh, join Junior ROTC when I was in high school. So I went through Junior ROTC in high school, and then uh, went to college, uh, enlisted in ROTC there. Where would you go to college? Colorado State University okay. in Fort Collins. I uh, majored in uh, civil engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, my goal was to become an environmental engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, war was heating up, as you know, in Vietnam through those years. And uh, civil engineering took a little bit more time than just the typical four years. Our uh, deferments, draft deferments were good for four. Mm -hmm. And so I had an additional motivation to be in ROTC because mm -hmm. I didn't have to worry about being drafted. Yeah. And so I went through that. Uh, interesting, interesting program. The uh, thing that w we had instead of boot camp was summer camp. I went to summer camp in Fort Raleigh, Kansas hot, humid, <laughs> sticky, and one of the things that really impressed me, they had a, a familiarization with helicopters. And these guys came roaring in in helicopters, landed right in front of us, mm. told us how great it was to be a pilot. And at that moment, I decided I was going to be a pilot. Okay. I was not going to be a ground pounder. Yeah. So that was my, uh, my start towards aviation. Okay. So I went back to school, passed the physical, passed the written exam, um, signed up and they put me through initial flight training in college and I got a private pilot's license okay. at school. Um, got married my senior year mm -hmm. um, before I knew what my future was going to be mm -hmm. and uh, ended up commissioned in June of 1969. Went to Fort Sam Houston, Texas for my officer basic course. Uh, got a course in medical care, field medicine, um, all the things I needed to know to be a member of the Medical Service Corps. Mm -hmm. Medical Service Corps was my uh, first choice for a branch. So why Medical Service Corps? Uh, I wanted to be an environmental engineer. And in the Army, environmental engineering is in the Medical Service Corps. Hmm. So plan A was to become a helicopter pilot. Plan B was to be an environmental engineer. Okay. So uh, working both ways. The uh, people that counseled me, each uh, officer was assigned a counselor. Uh, they were sanitary engineers, environmental engineers, and they said, you're crazy. <laughs> you don't want to be a pilot. <laughs> now, stay with us here in San Antonio. We go down to Rio de Janeiro for Carnival, and we have a great time, and we don't go to combat, <laughs> and you ought to stick with us. But uh, I'd already committed, and I uh, was kind of excited about becoming a, a pilot. So, graduated from uh, Officer Basic Course, went on to flight school, 
uh, we all went to Fort Walters, Texas. Ended up uh, that my wife was pregnant, and so my daughter was born in Texas, in Fort Walters. And she was uh, born the day, well, my wife went into labor, the day I soloed. Uh, wow. Solo is the, the first yeah. flight you take as an aviator by yourself. Now, and what it, were you soloing in? It was a TH-55. Okay. It was a little bitty two-seater, gasoline-powered okay. helicopter. Okay. Um, the civilian version was a Hughes 300, and I think it's been bought up by somebody else. They're okay. still flying around. Little bitty things. Little what, what did it feel like to, the first time you took a plane up by yourself? <laughs> Not by yourself, but flying okay, so by I yourself. So I already had a, a private pilot's license. And so uh, in college, my first solo yeah. flight, they say your first solo flight is your safest flight ever because you're not distracted, you're totally focused, you do everything mm -hmm. exactly by the book, and so it's, it's safe. So that was pretty scary. Mm -hmm. And then flying a helicopter is even scarier because yeah. like you never knew how to fly. Yeah. And so you just get in and say, hmm, okay, well, I know how to do this. And okay. uh, it's a little nerve wracking, but you go around and make three takeoffs and landing. Okay. Um, so the reward for that is uh, at Fort Rucker, at uh, Fort Walters, they'd stop by the local Holiday Inn and throw you in the swimming pool. They'd cross rotor blades in front of the swimming pool, <laughs> and uh, everybody that soloed got thrown in. Except uh, I'd been notified my wife is in labor, so I went right from the flight line to the hospital, and I missed that, that <laughs> life-changing event of being thrown in the pool. So daughter was born the next day. Uh, finished Fort Walters, uh, I was called primary, and then went to advanced helicopter training in Savannah, Georgia at Hunter Army Airfield. Mm -hmm. So honey, Hunter was good, most everybody else went to Fort Rucker, and uh, me and my buddies thought that uh, Savannah might be a lot more fun yep. than Fort Rucker. Yep. In retrospect, now that I know about the beaches in Alabama, it might have been more fun. <laughs> we enjoyed Savannah. Um, Interesting thing with uh, flight school, we went through as officers. There was there were warrant officers candidates that went through at the same time, and we had a number of National Guard people that were going through flight school with us, and we got along great until about the last month or so, and they said you can call us anything you want, but in 90 days or whatever you can call us at home, and everybody else you're going to Vietnam, and so we uh, we had a little friction yeah. with the National Guard guys with that. But anyway, just you go on, graduated from flight school at the end of May, got my orders to go to Vietnam, took uh, wife and daughter back to Denver so uh, her family could take care of her. And um, right after 4th of July, 1970, hopped on the Big Bird out of San Francisco and went to Vietnam. You were pretty sure you were gonna go to Vietnam, I assume, when you- It was a done deal. If you were a helicopter pilot at that point in time, you were going to Vietnam. I did ask uh, the branch if there were any options to go to Germany or Korea or someplace else, and they said no. Mm -hmm. They said, we've lost too many pilots. We need you in Vietnam. Yeah. So, That's what you wanted to do. That's real Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so actually, I, uh, I caught up with a buddy of mine from flight school that was also a medical service corps officer. Uh, lived in San Francisco, spent the, the day with him, yeah. went to the airport uh, late that night, hopped on a... Boeing 707 and, and flew to Okinawa and then into Tatsumi. When you were in San Francisco before deploying, were you out walking around in your uniform at all? No. No, no, no uniforms. Uh, I guess I had to fly over on standby in uniform. And then uh, we got into our civilian clothes. We didn't have a lot of time. So we, yeah. Yeah. we went to the local grocery store and got a bottle of rum to take with us yeah. to get us through the flight. <laughs> Didn't have restrictions on that, yeah. and uh, flight left about midnight, so we sat in the airport and mm -hmm. got on. Flight over was uh, was quiet. I remember we watched the science fiction movie The Thing, <laughs> that stuck in my mind. That was a, a good movie, <laughs> scary <laughs> one, and uh, had cute flight attendants. Uh, in Okinawa, it's on SR-71 spy plane on the runway, hmm. and you know, it's secret that those even existed, so that was uh, yeah. something we yeah. talked about. What on earth is that? Yeah. It looks like a rocket ship. Huh. Um, Tonsonute, uh, you could see smoke in various areas, like there was war going on, uh, short vinyl. I thought, well, hopefully we don't get shot down. 
find the 707 in the Thompson Inn, which we didn't. Um, well, when you got off the plane at Thompson Inn, what was your first impression, your first thought? It was really hot, really humid. Um, in the airport, well, not in the airport, when we got to the uh, assignment center or whatever it was that we went to, there were troops coming back from Cambodia. They oh. just got into Cambodia to the uh, Parrot's Peak area. Mm -hmm. And so these guys were just worn out. You could just tell they'd been through a, a lot. They were dirty, dusty, muddy, tired, yeah. sweaty. And uh, so my reaction to that is, okay, there's stuff going on here. Mm -hmm. And this was middle of 1970, is that right? July of 1970. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Go ahead and continue. And so uh, that's when we, we went into Cambodia. Uh, Spent the night the next morning, got our assignments. Me and another guy were assigned to uh, the demilitarized zone as Dr. Soft pilots. And so we were saying, okay, so what can they do to us? Send us to Vietnam and send us up to the demilitarized zone? It can't get any worse than that. <laughs> Not at all. So we just kind of grinned and bared it and uh, hopped on a C-130, flew in. And I was trying to remember, I think it was into Da Nang. Um, landed there, and then uh, the unit had sent a helicopter down to pick us up. So uh, jet lag and all, we flew back up to Fubai, which is a little town south of the, uh, the old city of Wei, and uh, got a little bit oriented into our unit, got assigned to our hooch, which was where we lived, and met our hooch maid, who was the Vietnamese girl who came and did our laundry, made our beds for us. And we're told if we wanted to eat, we needed to hop the helicopter ride over to the hospital. That's where the, the mess hall was. And that we were going to have a uh, meeting at the officer's club in the morning. And our officer's club was just uh, one of the rooms in one of the hooches that had a table in it. And that was about it. It did have an air conditioner, so that was nice. What unit were you in at the time? I was in the 571st Medical Detachment. And we were co-located with the 237th Medical Detachment and shared uh, facilities, had the same commanding officer, so it was more than just a co-located unit. It was essentially an extension of the unit. So. And there might be people watching this and listening to it that don't know what the DMZ was. Mm -hmm. Would you mm -hmm. just briefly explain sure, what the DMZ sure. was? Okay, so the war in Vietnam was between South Vietnam and North Vietnam. And I believe it was the end of World War II, they um, divided Vietnam into the north and south with a demilitarized zone in between. Okay. And so the idea was the demilitarized zone would remain that, yeah. and that would be the uh, demarcation of both sides. Okay. And of course, uh, the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese came through the demilitarized zone south, and then they also went through Laos. Mm -hmm. They had the Ho Chi Minh Trail, mm -hmm. um, which was a dirt road through Laos that was uh, used for trucks and bringing arms and supplies and people uh, down from North Vietnam. Okay. And so I'll talk about that a little bit later, yeah. but uh, it, was, it was right there. So you, you've reached the area where you're going to be mm -hmm. stationed and you're having, having this meeting. Mm -hmm. Did they go into some detail about your mission and, uh, or was it just a general meeting. Yeah, here's the new guy. Yeah. Uh, welcome him. Uh, he's going to be over here and uh, he'll start <coughs> flying tomorrow. Okay. And uh, you know, told me where to eat, showed me where the showers were, um, okay. introduced me to, to people. Yeah. I don't remember all the names okay. first time around, but uh, got, that was kind of the orientation. Right. Uh, commander didn't give us a pep talk, didn't talk about how important our mission was or, yeah. or anything like that. Okay. Uh, it's like, uh, glad you're here. No, good mm -hmm. to have some, re some replacements. Mm -hmm. And uh, away we went. Okay. Continue and tell us about mm -hmm. your experiences, what, you know, okay. what your mission ended up being and what okay. you did. All right. Well, first night there, uh, we took incoming from uh, somewhere from the North Vietnamese and uh, it hit an uh, uh, aircraft unit next to ours and killed one of the pilots. Mm -hmm. So. First night, I found out where the bunkers were and uh, learned what a pucker factor was. Yes. <laughs> uh, and that's when you get real nervous and your rear end puckers. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, introduction to that. Um, and then started flying 
the next day, actually, went out and did some missions. Nothing uh, really in the field, hospital transfers and a, a few things just to kind of get oriented. Now, by hospital transfers, do you mean moving personnel from one place? From one to hospital another? to another or from a, a field hospital to a, a bigger hospital. Okay. So those were uh, often done by helicopter because that yeah. was the best way to do it. Okay. And so gradually uh, moved into flying real missions and hot missions and really started understanding the attitude of dust off and uh, I guess one of the things that people need to know is why were they called dust off mm -hmm. okay so dust off was the first call sign used or was a call sign used I don't know it was the first one in 1963 for aeromedical evacuation and it was actually a sign by the Navy that had a official code of, of call signs. And so the next thing in the alphabetical list was dust off. Oh, oh. So it was used yeah. that one time and it stuck. Yeah, and so okay. uh, oh. I thought that was a good one. So yeah. through the entire Vietnam War, it was dust off. Okay. And then in the, uh, the Middle East, uh, they still use dust off and I think they still use dust off today. Huh. So in combat, it was dust off. Flying in the United States, we didn't use dust off. Okay. So that was... Uh, Kind of an honor yeah. to have that call sign. And um, went up to our field site, which was Quang Tri, much closer to the demilitarized zone. Uh, spent a month there, actually, uh, flying, and really got indoctrinated. The uh, aircraft commanders uh, taught me the things you need to know to mm -hmm. fly in combat, how you do a tactical approach, uh, what to ask people on the ground as far as the enemy situation. Um, we'd ask people to pop smoke, we'd never tell them the color, and then they would uh, say, well, smoke out, and we came up with supposedly coded names like Goopy Grape or Purple and, and uh, mm -hmm. Red Raspberry and uh, lemon, ye lemon Yellow and stuff that supposedly confused the, the North Vietnamese so they couldn't think about yeah. what color smoke to, yeah. to look at. And sometimes we'd uh, say something like, well, there's Goofy Grape, and then you'll see two or three more other smokes come up with the same color. And so you'd always go to the first one. Okay. And there were, there were times when people went in and, uh, and landed in North Vietnamese compounds. A friend of mine actually landed. He was called in by them, landed, and uh, noticed that the uniform forms weren't right as he was coming in. Great. And, uh, they wanted us to pick up a doctor and take him to the hospital because they figured he was very valuable and uh, knew that the Americans would take good care of him. And so he took the doctor on board and flew away and that was now, it. I want to be sure I understand this. He landed in a North Vietnamese unit's area. Area, Right. They called him in. They had an English speaking person call him in. Huh. Uh, said, no, we need to have an urgent casualty. And he didn't know it was not South Vietnamese until he was coming in and noticed the North Vietnamese uniforms. So what did he do then? He landed. You know, it just you don't have much choice. Yeah. You fly away, they're going to shoot you down. So yeah. you might as well land. And uh, they explained the situation. And uh, huh. he took the doctor back to the hospital. Wow. So as a medic, and I was a medic, oh. uh, you're protected by the Geneva Convention. And so okay. the North Vietnamese are connected protected, South Vietnamese, everybody, it's considered a war crime to uh, shoot at or take hostile action towards medical personnel. It wasn't exactly honored by the North Vietnamese. We got shot up a lot. Yeah. And in theory, we could not be held as a prisoner of war. <coughs> I guess in actuality, we weren't a prisoner of war. We were a retained person, which yeah. didn't have any special status. Yeah. But under the Geneva Convention, we were supposed to only be used to provide medical care to American soldiers and then released when that care was no longer needed. And I don't think that ever happened, but that's what the Geneva Convention said. Okay. So uh, I had a medic I stamped on the back of my ID and we had uh, cro red crosses on things. And the red crosses were good targets. Yeah. yeah. What was the size of the crew? Were you flying Hueys? Hueys or? Yeah, okay. flew Hueys. Uh, crew was four. We had an aircraft commander, uh, pilot, a more junior person, and a crew chief and medic. Okay. So the crew chief took care of the, the helicopter, made sure it was flyable, 
And I always liked the fact that they flew with us because they had a vested interest. Yeah. So we counted on him to make sure everything was mechanically sound and they yeah. counted yeah. on us to yeah. get him back alive. <laughs> <laughs> and that worked out pretty well. So real close between the, uh, the crew and the, the pilots. Uh, they were enlisted men and they had enlisted quarters, mm -hmm. but, uh, but we were very close. And I'm probably closer to more of my crew now as far as unit mm -hmm. reunions yeah. than other pilots. Yeah. Well, I've looked at your biographical form mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you described some of the missions that you flew. Mm -hmm. um, would you talk about some of those missions, okay. where you went, what the mission was, what happened when you mm -hmm. got there? And, Okay, well I mentioned earlier that, uh, that Laos and the Ho Chi Minh Trail was a, a factor that I was going to talk about. In uh, early 1971, we invaded Laos, or we didn't. The Vietnamese Army invaded Laos, and then they uh, called on the Americans to provide air support. And so we had helicopter support, supplies, troops, medical evacuation, jet fighters, and so on. Uh, I was actually on leave back in the United States when they initiated that. I was skiing in Aspen. Got back to Vietnam and there was complete news blackout on everything. Uh -huh. And so didn't know what was going on, but they said it was big and it was up north and I needed to get back to my unit. Got back to my unit and uh, we had moved back to Quezon that uh, the Marines had been chased out of in 1968. And so uh, as soon as I got back, I got on a helicopter, got a crew, flew up to Quezon and spent uh, rotations of about three or four days in Quezon. So Quezon was support of the Vietnamese in Laos. And during that time, um, I think helicopters took more casualties and uh, saw a lot more action than any other time in the war, mm -hmm. as far as Americans. And I got shot up with anti-aircraft fire and mortars. Um, that's where I got shot down. It was not shot down and going down in flames, but the aircraft wasn't flyable when we had to land. Got ambushed. Um, lots and lots of, of things going on. Many missions. Um, the South Vietnamese fought bravely, but uh, when it was time to retreat, they wanted to get out of Laos mm -hmm. pretty quick. So we would get uh, overloaded with Vietnamese on our helicopters to the point we couldn't break, out, break ground. Uh, they were little, but uh, there were times that we would take off with 15 to 20 Vietnamese mm -hmm. on board hanging from the skids. And uh, you may have seen pictures of Vietnamese hanging from skids. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the situation we were in. The crews tried putting grease on the skids. They couldn't hold on. Um, they had to push them off if we couldn't get off the ground. Yeah. And uh, kind of understood their situation. We uh, went as far as the deepest penetration into Laos. Um, picked up many, many casualties. The Vietnamese wanted us to, uh, to carry their dead out, and mm -hmm. we would. Mm -hmm. uh, that was not our mission, but if we had room, we'd bring their dead out as well. And there were times that we were just loaded. As far as blood and guts, we had uh, traumatic amputations, head wounds, uh, sucking chest wounds, mm -hmm. so much blood in the back that uh, we'd have to get a hose and hose it out before we went on the next mission. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty pretty uh, gruesome stuff. It had to be, yeah. to be seeing that day after yeah. day. Yeah. Uh, lost my roommate. Uh, he, mm -hmm. he was killed in action. Uh, picked up a crew that uh, a case on that had run into a barbed wire fence refueling at night. There was fog and uh, burst into flames, killed everybody on board. Mm -hmm. That's another dust off helicopter. So some of those things were really burned into my, my memory. And on that, uh, that crash where the other yeah. dust off crew was killed, I completely forgot about it. Mm -hmm. completely left my memory and I was talking to uh, a crew chief probably seven or eight years ago uh, just about you know what we did he mentioned that particular event and uh, he was talking and he said I don't know who the pilot was and I thought and I said I was mm -hmm. and I just it started to come back to me I just completely buried it you know they say wow. we take memories and we put them in a little box and yeah. we stick them in the corner of our brain and and uh, leave them there, yeah. and I had done that with that one. And that was probably one of the worst experiences. Can you talk about that, about when you got shot down and what happened and what was going through your mind at the time and what 
what you saw when you got down and how, how you got out? Okay, well, a couple of times. The, uh, the first one I should have landed. We got shot up with 51 caliber anti-aircraft machine gun. And I felt the impacts on the helicopter. And the crew said, we've been hit. I said, yeah, I know. But we're still flying. So we went ahead. We were heading into Laos. And so we went all the way into uh, uh, Fire Base Sophia, which was the farthest one in. Picked up the wounded and came back. And then landed. And we looked. And we had some holes in the helicopter and the rotor blades. And everything seemed OK. And so we took it down and exchanged it for another helicopter. So I wasn't shot down that time. But when they took the uh, rotor head off, one of the 51 caliber bullets had hit in the mast and nearly taken the mast off. Jeez. And the, the sergeant that did it uh, gave me the front end of that 51 caliber bullet as a souvenir. Wow. And he said if it had been uh, just you know, a fraction of an inch either way, it might have taken your rotor head off. Gosh. So uh, that was interesting. Yeah. That was one of those nights he gave it to me, and I went to the officers' club and drank very heavily. <laughs> Don't blame you a bit. <laughs> but uh, no, I think the hand of God yeah. was uh, protecting me yeah. at that time. The time we got shot down, we uh, we were ambushed. We were called in on a mission, and as we were getting close, we took heavy fire. We did have gunships with us, but uh, we managed to have enough enough power to get away and find a, another area that was secure we were leaking hydraulic fluid and so the, the aircraft was vibrating um, and if we'd flown much longer without hydraulics the uh, controls are real hard to move mm -hmm. um, we practiced landing without hydraulics and it's really difficult mm -hmm. but uh, we got down before that got things checked out got another aircraft took that one in for repair <laughs> yeah. went through a lot of, uh, of aircraft there were there were actually crews that would go through two or three aircraft in a day, but uh, I didn't have days like that, wow. fortunately. And uh, we got shut up a lot. Um, one of the pictures I have uh, shows me pointing to a bullet hole yeah. in my uh, helicopter that came within oh, a fraction of an inch of my foot. Oh, where is it? It's this one. So that. Young guy, does it show very well? Not Back, there. there you go. There you like go. that? Okay. Yep. A young looking guy's me, <laughs> and my finger is pointing at a AK-47 hole coming out that went in chin bubble behind my foot, right by my foot, and then, uh, went out. Didn't, didn't touch my radios, so that was good. So I Gosh. appreciated that. But uh, anyway, we got shot up a lot, but nobody ever got hit, none mm -hmm. of my crew. Okay. They, uh, we had what was called a, a chicken plate for the pilots, which was a vest and then the plating around the seats. And then the crew would sit on an armor vest. And they, uh, a couple times they get a, a bullet that hit the armor plating underneath them, oh. uh, but never, never hit them. Oh. And uh, I never got hit in my chicken plate either. Oh. Now, at any point did you get involved in rescuing or evacuating Civilians, children, all of the above? Or? Yes, all of the above. We rescued uh, Koreans, we rescued Americans, we rescued scout dogs, huh. uh, North Vietnamese soldiers, yeah. uh, and civilians. One of the uh, important missions was to try to win the hearts and minds mm -hmm. of the Vietnamese. And so uh, when things were quiet, and uh, peaceful, we would fly nurses out to the villages to provide medical care for the people out there. Mm -hmm. If somebody was urgently sick, they'd call us typically in the middle of the night to uh, come and bring them to the hospital, and we would go pick them up. Mm -hmm. uh, one of their favorite things was uh, to have a baby born in an American hospital. Huh. They felt that that was really good luck. And so we had a lot of pregnant mama sons that we'd go pick up. And I had several babies born on my helicopter. Wow. So our medics knew how to deliver babies. And uh, I helped with one in the emergency room. A nurse just decided I needed to experience childbirth <laughs> from the other end. And so, <laughs> so she made me sit there and help uh, a little bit with that. So that was a, an interesting experience. Well, that had to make you feel good. Yeah. I mean, rescue and... Civilians, civilians, children, yeah, yeah. delivering babies. And uh, we had 
uh, a good relationship with an orphanage in the city mm -hmm. of Way. And for Christmas, uh, we threw a Christmas party for mm -hmm. the kids. And so the nuns brought up the, the kids and we had a Christmas tree and I have a picture of the Christmas oh. tree uh, where we brought them up. And it was just so much fun. They sang Christmas carols for us. Wow. Uh, we gave them presents. They just beamed with the presents that we gave them. Uh, got a couple of relevant pictures. This is the uh, oh. Christmas tree huh. right back here. Yeah. Not a fancy tree, but not many good Christmas trees in Vietnam. We had some <laughs> lights and a few things, so, so that was pretty nice. And uh, this is one of the orphans. I got a picture oh. of him in front of our uh, operations building. And they're just cute kids. Yeah. And I, you just wonder yeah. what happened to them after the war. And uh, just never really know. I know things were, were yeah. very difficult. Yeah for a lot of years after the war. Yeah, you do always wonder what happened to those children, mm -hmm. particularly. Yeah. So uh, some of the interesting things, uh, some of the, well, actually one of the warrant officers became a father uh, with one of the Vietnamese mm -hmm. women over there. Okay. He was married, mm -hmm. came back, and uh, his child uh, was not welcome in Vietnam. The uh, Eurasians, uh, being half American, mm -hmm. and so the mother knew how to get a hold of him and just kept writing him, and he figured out how to get her out with her daughter, mm. and moved her out, moved her to Texas. Uh, his wife, I guess, understood, huh. and so uh, she made it out, went through college. I think she's a doctor. In Golly. So that's the one story that... Now that's quite a there. story there. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And I, one of those things, you go to a reunion and you kind of ask what's going on and, and some of these stories come out. So they had a picture of him in Vietnam and then a picture of him with his Vietnamese uh, girlfriend and girlfriend's daughter and all oh, wow. that. So yeah. just some of those stories just keep going on and on. Yeah. So enjoyed that. Uh, no, there was good and there was bad. And the good was the things that we could do for the Vietnamese people. The, uh, the North Vietnamese soldiers were interested. The uh, South Vietnamese tended to be kind of scrawny and uh, not super motivated. Mm -hmm. The Vort North Vietnamese were strong, uh, resilient, dedicated, uh, real fighters, uh, mm -hmm. just muscle tone, I mm -hmm. guess from carrying things back and forth down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, <laughs> uh, very yeah. strong. And uh, they could be severely wounded and just scowl at you. Huh. you know, and they were scared. Now, they'd yeah. be picked up by an American helicopter. They were hurt, and they didn't know what was going to happen to them. Yeah. And so I can understand that. Yeah. And uh, we take them to the hospital, and they got the same care as anybody else. That's now cool. they would get whole blood if they needed whole blood, uh, taken care of, and you could just see their attitude change. Now, just yeah. uh, that's better care than they get from the North Vietnamese. Yeah. They get maybe a doctor would get whole blood, but soldiers wouldn't. And so they, you just see an attitude change. And one of the things that, uh, that I did, and I, as I was going through thinking about yeah. all of this, something just to mention, is I, uh, after we did a pickup, we pick up patients, uh, you know, various conditions. And I'd always, after we got out of the area, I'd always look back, check out what's going on with the patients, talk to the medics, and uh, try to make eye contact mm -hmm. with the people we picked up and give them a, a thumbs up yeah. to see what their reaction was. And uh, a lot of times it was fear, uh, but once in a while they'd smile back, hmm. which you wonder, you know, somebody that's severely hurt, why would they smile back? I don't know if it was shock yeah. or just happy to know that they were going home yeah. or what, but uh, it was really important to me to make a connection yeah. with them and know that, that we really cared. Uh, and just the, the attitude of, of dust off. Uh, and it developed, and I think everybody had the attitude that our mission was to save lives, mm -hmm. and we would do anything that we needed to mm -hmm. to save a life. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the time we got away with it. <laughs> <laughs> but we were flying alone, solo ships, unarmed, in extremely hostile territory. So you had no other aircraft up there with you? you were Not just usually. Lone but Ranger. <laughs> when we were in Laos, we typically went with gunships. Okay. We'd have a gunship escort. But usually, call us up day or night, whatever, we'd be airborne in a matter of a couple of minutes, we'd get the mission in the air and do whatever it took. Hmm. So, and that was rewarding. 
And so, yeah. Yeah, a lot of missions, a lot of patience. Uh, no idea what those people are doing now. Yeah. So, I did, uh, we had a reunion in Las Vegas two years ago with the uh, doctors and nurses that we served with, which was really interesting. And one of the doctors had an interesting story. He was in the airport in Houston, and this uh, veteran went by that had a prosthetic leg. And he was talking to him, saying, oh, you're in Vietnam, yeah. Uh, you're in Vietnam, yeah. I was a doctor. Well, where'd you lose your leg? He says, uh, well, I was on the demilitarized zone. Uh, what year? 1970. And he said, well, there was only one orthopedic surgeon on the demilitarized zone in 1970. That was me, so I'm the one that took your leg. And uh, he, he said that the guy said, well, thanks for saving my life. Gosh. And they became good friends. Boy, that's so, quite a story. It was. That was really neat. Wow. So well, didn't, didn't hear many stories like that, but every yeah. once in a while, yeah. you know, people would connect. So that was great. Um, I don't know what else to say about it. You know, just there was good and there was bad. There were ups and there were downs. Um, hospital food was not good typically, except for midnight. The midnight uh, cooks would cook anything you wanted to order. Hmm. And so if you were up late, that was the place to go. Nurses were really dedicated. Um, a few people had relationships with nurses. There were some marriages that came out of it. Hmm. Uh, and they were always invited to our, our reunions. And hmm. a few would, would come, probably three or four. Yeah. Um, sisters of uh, pilots we lost would show up, hmm. families. That's good of them would show up. And uh, all that was that was good. It was a kind of a, a family yeah. type situation. Uh, the nurses just uh, voluntary, why would you volunteer as a nurse to go into a combat zone? And particularly to be in you know, f close to the front lines. They were never in the front lines, but close to yeah. the front, front lines. And um, several of them uh, had emotional problems afterwards, just mm. seeing all the carnage that yeah. they saw. Yeah. Uh, but uh, just wonderful women, just really dedicated. So, <coughs> finished the year, came back. Did you ever have any opportunity at all to go into the towns, just wander oh, around, yeah. or just on, yeah. on your own? Or? Yeah. Uh, mostly the cities were off limits. Right. But uh, occasionally we go down to Da Nang, mm -hmm. and you had to be careful in Da Nang because the the kids, they call them coyotes, would come and snatch your wristwatch right oh, off yeah. your, yeah. your wrist. Yeah. Or if you had something <coughs> hanging in your Jeep or whatever, a camera, that'd disappear. Um, they're just doing what they could yeah. do. But uh, yeah, Da Nang, we'd go around, we, we went shopping. It's kind of interesting. I think it was only off limits a couple times. Saigon, we went down there to pick up some replacement helicopters and uh, had a chance to go around Saigon. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the best event, though, was our hooch maid invited us to go to a family dinner in Way. Oh. And so uh, we bought them a pig and a chicken or something like that to cook and went in. And um, it was interesting how they lived. They, uh, the husband was a Vietnamese soldier, and uh, they lived in a little one-room building that had um, blankets hanging to partition it off. And there was a bedroom for grandma and grandpa, and that was their private bedroom. And then their children, uh, there were two couples, had another partitioned off area. And so the two of them, that yeah. was their bedroom. And then the kids just slept wherever they could sleep. They had a table, they had a TV, they had a refrigerator, wow. um, stove to cook on, and that was their house. Gosh. And, uh, had a great meal. Uh, it was really tasty. The uh, Vietnamese don't do chickens like we do. They just chop it up mm -hmm. with bones and all in each piece. And so that was a little strange. But uh, had a good meal. Ended up uh, with dysentery the next day for some reason. <laughs> Not used to that stuff. But that was, that was really a good experience. And that was really special for them to have us in their homes. And, and I bet it was. Did, were you able to communicate with the Vietnamese soldier? Did any of them speak any English? Or? Each unit had people that could speak. I mean, it's that specific not attached, supper. Yeah, yeah. Not, not attached to us. And our yeah. hooch mate spoke okay. okay English. No, they could get by. 
but uh, never tried to talk to soldiers that we picked up. Yeah. Now, on missions, particularly in, into Laos, we only had uh, Vietnamese mm -hmm. interpreters there that we yeah. spoke to. And they spoke pretty good English. When our crews were trying to pick up patients on the ground, of course, the, the people bringing the patients understood sign language like, hurry up, <laughs> get down, yeah. get out of here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so sign language worked pretty well. We didn't need to, to speak other than that. Now, you mentioned going back to Colorado and then coming back to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Now, that, was that those that, was that like an R&R? &R okay, so during the year you were entitled to one seven-day leave to go wherever you wanted, and then a seven-day R&R, so you had two weeks. Mm -hmm. And so the single guys would go to Singapore, Australia, wherever. Uh, so in the wintertime, I took my leave and went back to Colorado to go skiing with my wife hmm. and see my family. And then in the spring, I took an R&R &R and went to Hawaii, and my wife in Hawaii. Describe what that was like, leaving, not just leaving Vietnam in a war zone, but leaving what you had been doing, and then all of a sudden being in the mountains of Colorado. Well, it's a shock. It really is. You know, just The first thing I noticed was at night there weren't parachute flares in the sky. The skies were actually dark. And I uh, had to kind of mind my manners and be careful how I spoke yeah. about things. Um, I think when we came back, we could come back in civilian clothes. And so I don't remember any issues as far as people thinking I was military or anything. Yeah. Um, and it was short, mm -hmm. but uh, it was just culture shock, you know, from being in a war zone and yeah. the humidity and rainy season and the dead fish smells and all the stuff in Vietnam to the United States mm -hmm. yeah. resort. Yeah. Uh, Hawaii or, or Aspen, Colorado, either place, like, this is really different. Yeah. But it was short, and so right. never really disconnected with okay. being in Vietnam over that short period of time. So you pretty much hit the ground running when you got back to yeah. Vietnam. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, when I went back uh, for the Laos invasion, the Lamps on 719, it was just, you know, fly up there, hop in a helicopter, and fly away. Yeah. So uh, there was no downtime at all. Hmm. So, uh, coming back, more questions while I was there? Lamson 719, mm -hmm. anything you want to share about that? Okay, so Lamson 719 was the operational name for the invasion of Laos. And I used to know what Lamson 719 meant, but I, I can't remember. The uh, 71 was 1971, and 9 uh, had some significance, but it wasn't the month because it, it started in February. In Lamson, I don't know, I'd have to Google it again. It's been a long time. But that was, uh, that was the last big operation. It was the, the first really big operation the Vietnamese Army had done by themselves with American support. And uh, some people, I think the media said that they ran in terror and they were terrible. And uh, I didn't see that. I think they were good soldiers. They were. Uh, in some cases used as bait. They were put on a fire base and surrounded by the North Vietnamese and then we would just bring in B-52 strikes and jet strikes and, and things to uh, virtually annihilate the North Vietnamese. I remember sleeping at night. We slept at Quezon. We had little Quonset sort of things to sleep in and you could feel the ground rumbling from the B-52 strikes. You could feel the vibrations. And, uh, I don't know how far away, but they weren't next door. Mm. Those were just huge. Mm. Um, B-52s would drop 1,000-pound bombs and just obliterate everything. Mm. So they'd destroy the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the road, and then in a couple of days it'd be rebuilt. Mm. They had everything in hiding, and they'd just bring it out and mm. rebuild it. Mm. So. And I've got one more question. I hope this isn't mm -hmm. a stupid question. Well, there's Forgive no such me if thing, it is. right? <laughs> but you mentioned at least twice being called in once for the North Vietnamese doctor. Mm -hmm. How did being called in work? Did, did you not, was there no way of knowing whether it was a legitimate call? There was. Um, we had uh, secure things that we could decipher uh, coordinates in a, a hostile area. 
uh, for Lamson 719, the, the Laos invasion, we had secure radios, so you could turn them on secure, so only somebody else with a secure radio could uh, hear what you were talking about. I'd forgotten about those. And our orders were, if you ever got down, shot down, be sure to put some bullets through the secure radio, because <laughs> they didn't want them going over. But we would basically respond to anybody that called in. If it sounded real fishy, you know, if it was on a demilitarized zone and it was a pregnant mama son, we'd say, mm, I don't think so. But if it was a village and um, you know, I was in a peaceful area, anybody would call. We just had a radio operator and he would just take the message and uh, get the particulars, the call sign, where it was in general, uh, how urgent was it, and uh, give us a sheet of paper with the information and then we had to decide. Well, if someone, just to follow up on Sue's question, mm -hmm. You mentioned the experience mm -hmm. going into a North Vietnamese mm -hmm. unit's Now, just camp. to clarify, that was a friend of mine that did that. It right, right. Going would he, how would he know that wasn't a trap? I guess he wouldn't, would he? He didn't know until he got there. Huh. I was called in, no dust off, we have an urgent medevac, required such and such location. Um, no, call us when airborne. And they'd listened to enough of our missions that they knew exactly how to call in a mission. There was a little checklist that they were supposed to, to go So through. he knew, he would have known he was going into a North Vietnamese or he would not. The North Vietnamese calling it in would have had the checklist. Okay. And would then provide the information in the proper order and uh, answer all the questions. Hmm. Now, Vietnamese accent was no problem yeah. because we heard that all the time. Yeah. And so spoke enough English to uh, huh. get it in. And so. Wow. Now, our mission was to save a life. Yeah. It wasn't to uh, say, well, that one's not worth saving. The only mm. time we would say no is if it was just too dangerous to fly because of weather. Yeah. Uh, enemy situations, really the troops wouldn't, wouldn't bring us in if there was such heavy enemy fire they couldn't stand up. Mm. I've heard of people saying, well, no, we're not going to stand up because the enemy fire's too strong, but we want you to come in and land. <laughs> I heard stories like that, but they didn't do that yeah. uh, for us. They they learned that that wasn't a, a good outcome for anybody. But yeah, we just we would go now. Mm -hmm. If it was in a hostile area, uh, particularly out away from a fire support base, we would want some some additional confirmation. Mm -hmm. So if it was in the demilitarized zone, north of the uh, the last fire bases. Um, pick up a casualty, we'd need some confirmation or somebody that spoke very clear English. And so, you now sometimes we didn't have uh, people at the other end that has ciphers, so we'd say, well, who won the last World Series? Mm -hmm. Or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Okay. And uh, that isn't a real good one, but because yeah. the Vietnamese right. would know yeah. what the answer yeah. there was yeah. too. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but something like that. So we try to disguise things, but no. In all reality, we probably didn't disguise a thing and uh, just make us feel better. Yeah. But we didn't. Our, our mission was to, uh, to save a life. Hmm. And I brought my unit patch. <coughs> Look at that. Yeah. And it says to save a life right at the bottom. It sure does. Love it. Did that answer your question? It did. Yeah. And I've really only got one more, and I'm sorry. I don't no, please, no. Please. Are Answer. there any missions that stand, you've told it, this has been fantastic. Are there any missions that kind of stand out to you in terms of maybe one of the patients that you connect, or I don't know, anything that you haven't told us that stands out about any missions lots, that you flew? Lots and anything lots. Anything you want to share? We've got time, so if you, okay. now, now's well, the time. Okay, the uh, mission where I got a distinguished flying cross. That was a good one. Okay, so... Uh, at Quezon, uh, I think it was a recon team, American recon team on the ocean border, uh, special forces, or whatever, called in and they were surrounded, they had wounded, surrounded by North Vietnamese, they needed to be extracted immediately. They were in deep jungle, I had a jungle penetrator hoist so I could uh, hover above the trees and, and pull them out. And I was the only one that had one, so they said, Rick, you're up. <laughs> so. Off I went, I, I uh, enlisted some gunships, took over gunships to go with us because they were in heavy enemy contact. So uh, came up with a plan, talked it over with the crew, said do we want those gunships shooting uh, to keep the enemy down or do we want it quiet so we know if we're being shot at? 
and we decided keep them shooting because we don't know if want to know if we're being shot at. <laughs> 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 and so we went in um, low level, uh, no smoke. We did a, a flyover so that they could tell us about where they were, and we'd go back to that spot. So we flew over gunships, uh, came in blasting rockets and miniguns on either side of us, and then we came to a hover over the trees and pulled uh, six guys out while sitting in a hover. Gosh. Taking fire, um, we got them all out, got them on board, and then uh, flew away under fire, low level, and uh, got the wounded to the hospital and uh, the ones that weren't wounded out. Hmm. So that was exciting. That was very exciting. Um, That's an understatement. Like that. hmm? That's an understatement yeah. that it was exciting. Yeah. And. Uh, Oh, now this one I don't even like to think about. Went into the demilitarized zone in the heavy grass area to pick up some wounded uh, in a minefield. And so we, we picked them up. They, they thought they were out of the minefield. And as I was lifting up to hover to leave, uh, I guess I tripped a mine or the guy that had guide us, guided us in had uh, stepped on a mine or something, but just as we pulled away, he said, you got to come back, you got another casualty. And the guy's leg had been blown off just as we were leaving. Mm. So, and I, his face just is still in my, my mind. And he's one of the people that uh, I smiled at and gave him a thumbs up mm. and he smiled back and I yeah. couldn't figure out why he smiled. So I always remember Gosh. that. So, oh gee. Now there's, there's more. Uh, I mentioned the dust off aircraft that crashed the caisson and burned. Well, the two pilots didn't die immediately. They were seriously burned. And we were in heavy fog, pea soup. Now, you can barely see your hand in front of your face, which is one of the reasons they crashed. And uh, we were coming in pretty close to the same time and just got on the ground before the, the fog got too thick. Uh, and they were going sideways and hit some barbed wire, so it was something they just didn't see. So we, we landed and um, crew chief and medic and co-pilot got out and uh, did what they could to get the casualties out. Uh, got the, the pilot and the co-pilot out and couldn't get the, the crew. Got them on board, heavy, dense fog, and um, requested permission to go instrument flight rules and um, did essentially a vertical takeoff and then flew down to the hospital um, under instrument conditions mm. and um, in the United States you can't do a zero zero takeoff but uh, you know if you're in a situation you have the confidence to do it, you, you do it. Got them to the hospital and I found out from my crew later that we also had two other people on board that I completely forgotten about. Self-inflicted gunshot wounds, two Americans wow. that were with us and I'd forgotten about them. They got to the hospital and they kind of disappeared but uh, the casualties, one guy died uh, in the emergency room. The other guy went through surgery, um, seriously burned. Eyes were gone, ears were burned off. Uh, traumatic amputation of both legs. Um, he was alive, but uh, not much. And uh, they kept him and transported him to Japan for additional treatment on uh, a medevac, an Air Force medevac. And uh, he didn't make it. Mm -hmm. To Japan, and I think it was something that the the nurses thought that this kid just yeah. shouldn't make it. Yeah. Mm. Man, noteworthy. You know, I, a lot of them are kind of there and not, but uh, those are the real significant ones. Wow. Um, so that's kind of the blood and guts part of it. <laughs> yeah. So war is hell, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Anything else? <laughs> well, we want to eventually we'll move on to the rest of your life, yeah, but uh, this yeah. is such a fascinating story. I want to be sure that you have every opportunity to talk mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. anything that happened while you were in Vietnam. And we, yeah, there are uh, just, just interesting things. The, uh, some of the places that the people have heard of, like the Ashaw Valley. Mm -hmm. um, 101st Airborne had the Ashaw Valley, and they had uh, their own dust off unit. But occasionally we would get called in to go to the Ashaw Valley. And it was really a pretty valley. Oh. Uh, it, was, it had places like Hamburger Hill mm -hmm. in the Ashaw Valley. And it was uh, definitely owned by the North Vietnamese. 
But um, occasionally we get over there and we go to some of these fire bases, like named Ripcord and places like that. And uh, one of the things that was always fun is coming out of the mountains. You'd fly low level right at the trees, and then you'd find a ridge line where it would drop off, and so you'd climb as it dropped off, and so the separation between the ground and you was just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I always loved doing that. Crew would always get a little dizzy. <laughs> That was, that was cool. Well, you saw a lot of beauty even in the middle of all this yeah. carnage. The area around Quezon was really pretty. The uh, French had uh, hunting lodges historically up there. There were waterfalls, um, mountain streams. Uh -huh. uh, I always thought it'd be fun to go back to Quezon after the war because it was so pretty. And I got a call from a buddy of mine saying that they were building a peace garden in Quezon and where I like to go. And I thought about it and I thought, you know, I really don't want to go. He'd been there several times, and he said people were really very friendly and cordial. He'd been shot down mm -hmm. at Quezon. Mm. And um, he met the guys that supposedly shot him down and the mm -hmm. mountain yard villagers that were up there. And they walked up to the top of the hill where he'd been shot up. Mm. And so the story was good. Yeah. Um, the thing that, uh, that I did contribute is I designed the water system. Environmental engineer, water and wastewater, so I designed the water system for them. And they said, how can we get the price down? They said, buy all your stuff from China. And uh, they did, and the Chinese uh, did a great job of getting everything packaged up in a Connex and sent over. And, and when did you do that? Uh, a couple years ago. Huh. And so there's Peace Garden. The, uh, the guy that was orchestrating it, his, his son was actually doing a lot of the work, but he was the driving force. And he came down with uh, cancer, Agent Orange related. Huh. And so he said that his, his days of going to, to Vietnam are over. Yeah. He's just trying to stay alive right now. Yeah. But uh, had a chance and um, just, just couldn't bring myself to it. Yeah. Ran into a doctor here in uh, Atlanta. I was having some minor surgery and he mentioned he was a veteran and it turned out he was at the 18th Surgical Hospital where oh. I was stationed in Columbia oh. Tree. Okay. And I went through an old <coughs> pictures and found an old picture of it and gave it to him. Really? Which is huh. a small world. Yeah. It really is. Speaking of pictures, I know you've got some more pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, any of them that you'd like to have on this DVD, okay. is, now's the time to show uh, them. Yeah, well, this is a, a picture of pilots and, uh, and crew. It's, uh, it's really kind of hard to. It's okay, because it, it'll be in your folder, and yeah. so they can okay. look at it. So these are guys that I served with. They came back. Um, you know, one of them was the crew chief that reminded me of that mission that I'd completely forgotten uh -huh. about. And some of them became really good friends. And I still see them. This is my battle gear. This is yeah. not uh, flight-related battle yeah. gear. That's just a flak jacket. Right. My weapon of choice was a shotgun. We always carried something for personal protection. Yeah. And a 38 pistol that I always uh, kept unloaded. <laughs> And then if it was really hot, that I'd put five bullets in the six chambers. Um, and I guess the theory was you didn't want that, that one cooking off or something and shooting him in the legs. So the yeah. one that was in the yeah. actual chamber was, was not active. This is the uh, hospital ship sanctuary. And uh, Navy ship, hospital ship with uh, great surgical facilities. We take severely wounded troops out. Um, when it's out in the middle of the ocean at night, it's just a spot of light. And you have to fly instruments because you can get vertigo very easily. Yeah. And then uh, landing on a hospital ship that's moving is uh, is interesting because your landing pad is going up and down. Gosh. And so you got to time your uh, your approach so that you're going down when it's going down and, and catch it before it comes back up and smashes you. Were and you we trained had, to do that? I mean, no, we learned that on the job. Huh. Uh, just. Uh, You'd have to come in, they'd go into the wind, so you always had a headwind. So they'd turn, and then uh, they'd, they'd bring in, they had a radar so they could give you an instrument approach if you needed it. Wow. And just go in and, and time it. Now, sometimes you'd have to try a couple times, and if it was rough seas, it was tough. We had one, one helicopter that crashed hmm. and uh, just spent the skids, but it was not flyable, so they had to spend a couple days on the hospital ships with these cute nurses eating wonderful food. Oh, what <laughs> they a shame. They hated to leave. They really hated to leave. <laughs> uh, here is a group of, uh, of good friends at the uh, surgical hospital. Uh, 
Uh, the first guy on the left was my roommate that was killed in Laos. The uh, next guy became a fireman. Uh, we called him Crash, Crash Carter, because he crashed a couple times. Uh, once with a bunch of nurses that were just coming in country, their first experience was to crash. With crash, so that name, nickname stuck. Some administrators, and then uh, another guy uh, we called the kid because he was so young, he was 19 years old, flying, and uh, he was great, great pilot, great fun guy, and he, he died of uh, prostate cancer about five years ago, oh. Agent Orange. So a lot of Agent Orange issues. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been registered for Agent Orange, mm -hmm. but so far I uh, don't really have much. That's going on the road to Da Nang. Got a Schlitz beer can in my hand and my steel pot on and ready for, <laughs> ready for combat. <laughs> and then that's, that's also me. It's just I can't imagine I was really that young. But that's uh, in Da Nang at Red Beach, standing mm -hmm. in front of the, the bay. And uh, the expression on my face tells me it was really hot and I was yeah. really hot yeah. that day. Yeah. <laughs> that's at the controls. The uh -huh. aircraft commander. And I showed this one before, that's the, the bullet hole. And, uh, and that's it, those are my pictures. Wow. So, it's interesting. I've got other ones and they just kind of get lost. Yeah. And I don't know yeah. where they ended up. I think about the ones that I've seen over the years and they're someplace in some yeah. cubby hole at the house or something. Do you remember your last mission? And what I'm, the reason I ask that question, did you know that was going to be your last mission? And what was your feeling about this is my last mission? Oh, I think, I think it was just a hospital transfer from uh, the hospital up by the demilitarized zone down to Da Nang to uh, the surgical hospital mm -hmm. down there. Um, as I recall, there was a ceasefire, which meant that we weren't shooting at the North Vietnamese, but they were shooting at us. <laughs> the uh, guy that got shot down at Quezon, yeah. um, that invited me to go back, was shot down under the ceasefire. Okay. Um, but I think it was just an uneventful thing. Yeah. Uh, we had what was called a two-digit midget. And that is if you had less than 100 days left in country, you got down to two digits. And then the, about the last... 10 days, something like that. We typically didn't have pilots fly anything yeah. very dangerous. Yeah. And I do remember my, my final flyby. Um, they put smoke grenades on the skids and then do a low pass right down the flight line and then huh. take you off to, <laughs> to head home. So I do remember that. Wow. And I actually had a picture of that once upon a time, too, really? from inside the helicopter. Yeah. There aren't many external pictures of missions in helicopters, yeah. though, because yeah. we were on the inside. So. Yeah. Not much. Talk about your experience when you got home. Uh, <laughs> any incidents with protesters or anybody that gave you a hard time? Oh, <clears throat> flew uh, into Seattle and then to Denver. Uh, just a little anecdote, flying into Denver, um, the airplane declared an emergency. They didn't get all their landing gear down. And so they did a low pass past the tower, and they said, well, it looks okay, but we, we landed with fire trucks around and everything. And I thought, that, this would be my luck. <laughs> this is what you <laughs> But uh, everything was okay. And, uh, was, was this a civilian airplane? Yeah, it was... Uh, 707 type plane? Probably a 707. Okay. Uh, I don't know what airlines. But, uh, yeah, it was just regular commercial, everyday airline <laughs> coming in. Just my luck. But it was, it was fine. So my family uh, met me. I was wearing khakis and a flight jacket. And uh, people looked at me, but nobody mm -hmm. really got angry or no protesters. It was just me. It yeah. wasn't like a, a group, group yeah. coming in. But I got some looks, you yeah. know, kind of like, okay, what are you doing? Where you been? Yeah. Who'd you kill? <laughs> what, what's, what's going on? Yeah. So I was happy to get out of uniform. Yeah. You know, just... Uh, didn't feel comfortable. Most people really not only didn't care what you were doing, but really didn't like what you were doing, the mm -hmm. fact that you were part of that. And you could feel it. They didn't have to say anything. You could just feel it. 
so the people that were happy to see me back were my family. Yeah. And um, I didn't talk to people about it. And I talked to other uh, veterans because they kind of understood, but uh, just didn't talk about it for years. Mm -hmm. just, just put in the box and buried it away. And didn't really start thinking about it until uh, probably about 2002, 2003, um, 30 years. People started thinking about reunions and people mm -hmm. started going and getting pictures out and, mm -hmm. and uh, had reunions and things started coming back. Yeah. But um, just real quiet and I, I just knew people really didn't care. They didn't want to know. Do you find now, as time has gone on, that more people do want to know? They do. Uh, right now, of course, there's a big emphasis, let's welcome back the veterans. Mm -hmm. You've seen that, and I've seen that, and they've had ceremonies. The governor gave me a certificate and mm -hmm. a pin. And, you know, it's, um, it's a really nice gesture for a welcome home. But then when I go to church and talk to people, and they'll say, oh, you're a veteran. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Or they'll say sort of a, an empty thanks for your service but it's it's kind of empty yeah. you know, 50 years ago um, the people that really do care are the ones that have family or yeah. friends that were part of that when it really yeah. comes right down to it yeah. and, um, and probably more than just that but I think that's the, the predominant so I still get a cold feeling but I don't see any resentment really yeah. hmm. anymore still don't like Dang Fonda though I think you've <laughs> got a lot of people that agree with you on that. Mm -hmm. yep. And for the record, Jane Fonda went to North Vietnam and uh, was captured on film uh, operating an anti-aircraft gun and talking about uh, pilots who were war criminals and um, just did not do anything to endear herself mm -hmm. yeah. to the soldiers that were yeah. risking their lives. Yeah. That that picture's probably been seen by most people in this country. Mm -hmm. I think. And hopefully nobody's applauding her anymore, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they yeah. did once upon a time. Yeah. One of the uh, nurses I served with was at Kent State when there was the oh, shooting, really? when the yeah. uh, students got shot by the National Guard. Yeah. That, was, she had, that was quite a story yeah. of hers. Hmm. Uh, that was unfortunate. So it was a, it was a very dark time for the country. Well, did you, were you discharged after you got back to the States? Or, or, yeah. I got back and uh, was at Fort Carson, Colorado and flew civilian medical evacuation, military support for uh, safety and traffic is what they called it, MAST, medical assistance or military assistance to safety and traffic. And so they call us up, we go pick up traffic accidents, victims, um, went to uh, Aspen mm -hmm. several times to pick up people who had heart problems. Uh, heart attacks mm -hmm. and they couldn't make the ambulance trip back so they'd call us. They didn't huh. have civilian uh, medical helicopters yeah. and so we'd fly around and pick people up. Um, took a, a sick Indian back to his reservation in Wyoming one night. Oh, oh, gosh. <laughs> Indians always got special treatment. Yeah. And so I flew that uh, through March of 72 and then took some time off and went back to graduate school got a master's degree in engineering and uh, started a career in environmental engineering out of graduate school and um, just didn't think about Vietnam for many years after that. So good good career. Uh, had a son. Yeah, talk about graduate school. your career and your family and anything you want to okay, put so on I, the record. Yeah, I was in Fort Collins, Colorado with, uh, with the daughter, went to graduate school and then uh, decided which company I wanted to work for and uh, ended up getting an offer from a different company. And I was really disappointed. It was in New York. Went out to New York, interviewed, got an offer, came back, got an offer from the company I really wanted to go with. So um, ended up, instead of going to New York, went to Corvallis, Oregon, which was pretty oh, nice. Yeah. Enjoyed Oregon. Uh, moved to Seattle, was in Seattle for a few years. My son was born in Seattle. Doing the same thing, environmental engineering for oh primarily industries, some for the U.S. government. And from there I worked in Canada, in Calgary, uh, moved back to Denver. I uh, was in Denver for a few years working on some, some pretty interesting projects. Uh, energy crisis, we were looking at energy projects. 
went from there to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, which was a real experience, a real cultural change. Uh, learned all about Mardi Gras and <laughs> all that. That was an interesting, I was there four years, and uh, not a cultural fit for me. Um, no. Westerner from Colorado, uh, there's some cultural differences just being in the South, but being in Louisiana is really different. <laughs> So I went from there to Quebec, Canada. Hmm. So French speaking, but culturally entirely different than Louisiana that uh, mm -hmm. spoke French. And they said, they don't really speak French. <laughs> we don't know what they speak, but it's not <laughs> French. And of course, the, the Quebec French is different than uh, Parisian French. And so the people in France say that the Quebecois don't know how to speak French either. <laughs> but that was fun. Spent uh, some time there, then went to Washington, DC. Uh, lived there for a while and then came to Atlanta. 24 years ago. Uh, in the meantime, I got divorced, got remarried um, to a wonderful Southern girl that yeah. says I'm a Yankee. <laughs> and I say, yeah, you're right, but I've been here a long time. She said, doesn't matter, you're still a Yankee. <laughs> she was born in, uh, in Georgia, spent a lot of her time growing up in uh, Alabama. And uh, she's now back in Georgia. Uh -huh. And uh, we have Four kids between us, okay. two boys, two girls, all married, all with children. We have seven granddaughters, Wow! all so granddaughters, boy. ranging from, I guess, eight months to 20 years old, Gosh. Uh, living in Alabama, uh, Birmingham, and uh, Deetsville, which is outside of Montgomery, and then Salt Lake City, Utah, hmm. and Los Angeles, California. Okay. So all doing well, all employed. Doing great. I'm real proud of them all. Yeah, Love them all sure. dearly. I'm sure they're proud of you too. I hope so. <laughs> I want to go back to uh, something that we, we really didn't talk about. Okay. Uh, you, you received the Distinguished Flying Cross, mm -hmm. which is, as we all know, not something everybody gets. <laughs> Can you describe what was it that would be for your overall service, or was that for a spe specific mission? Or yeah, you know, I mentioned the uh, the hoist recovery mission yeah. on the ocean border. It was specifically for that mission. Okay. Okay, so that was recognition for that. I was actually awarded it when I got back to the states. Okay. Well, it was... takes a while, but uh, got that. Got a lot of air medals. I noticed you had 18 air medals. Mm -hmm. And that's based on the number of missions that you... Number of missions. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so 18 just is an expression of how many missions you were on and how many were combat. If it was a safe mission, it took 100 hours. If it was a hostile mission, it was 25 hours yeah. to get one. So I collected those, got a Vietnamese gallantry cross, uh, which was written up in Vietnamese. And so I'm not exactly sure what it says, but I'm sure it's <laughs> nice. <laughs> And a bronze star just for, for yeah. service. Yeah. One of the things that, uh, that I'm proud of is also a combat medic badge. Which is well, talk about that and talk, talk about mm -hmm. what's required to be awarded. A, okay, a, so uh, combat infantryman badge people have maybe seen, which is the rifle, mm -hmm. the old uh, Kentucky rifle with the blue around mm -hmm. it. Uh, for those that are medics, they have uh, a badge that has a caduceus mm -hmm. and a stretcher and a wreath on it that's combat medic badge. And to qualify for that, you have to have served in the capacity of being a field medic under okay. a combat situation assigned to a combat unit. Yeah. And so we were assigned to the 101st Airborne, more or less, during Lamson. So that's what qualified us. Yeah. Wow. So we got that. So I got an aviator badge, which was flight school. Yeah. And then I got the combat medic badge. Uh, you should be very proud of that. And I'm not sure we really got these numbers because you're modest about your accomplishments, but uh, it's true you f flew over a thousand missions and transported over 1,500 patients. And that's just a guess. Now I looked at my flight records, and uh, I'm pretty sure of the thousand missions I had over 800 hours. I had close to 900 hours of flight time. Mm. And uh, so you say, okay, most missions were less than an hour, so probably over a thousand. And most uh, missions we picked up more than one person. No, I mentioned sometimes 20. Yeah. But it was very seldom that we just picked up one person. So 1,500 might be an underestimate. Yeah, wow. So uh, 
back and forth, a lot of patients, a lot of people. Saved a lot of lives, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. I think it did. So, <clears throat> people ask if I uh, ever wanted to fly again. And uh, when I went into the Army, I was thinking, well, maybe I'd like to have a career as an aviator. But uh, flight schools were putting out five to 600 pilots a month. And so there were a lot of helicopter pilots at the end of Vietnam. So people I knew that were flying helicopters were doing things like logging, picking up a log, flying over, setting it down, crop dusting, uh, tourist stuff. But one of the real fun things that I got was an hour of flight time as a birthday present from my daughter and son-in-law. Huh. So I went over to uh, Peachtree to Cab Airport with one of the commercial operators and got in with the pilot and got to fly for an hour. Yeah. And that was really fun. That was about two years ago. And we went out to uh, Six Flags, low level down the Chattahoochee oh, River, really? flew around. I got to do most of the flying. He took it up the first time just to see if I could fly it. Yeah. Did some power off uh, auto rotations. Oh, wow. Um, I remember flying down the Chattahoochee River, there was a boat going down the river. Boy, I want to buzz that guy so bad. <laughs> and uh, the pilot I was with, he said, you know, you can't do that anymore. Everybody's got cell phones with cameras. <laughs> you know, take a picture of us. And if you do something like that, we'll get in some big trouble. <laughs> okay, I won't. <laughs> so that was a, a fun experience. But no, I was, I was so excited, I couldn't sleep for two days. I had oh, some bunch of adrenaline pumping through me after flying. But that was enough. He asked me if I wanted a job. He said, you Army guys are better trained than any of the pilots we're getting now. Yeah. I said, nope. <laughs> yeah. Not really. He said, they fight fires out in uh, California, yeah. and they set fires in Florida to back burn things. And they'll fly power lines just for inspections. Yeah. So that's not the same as flying in combat. Yeah. So you'd, ha you'd had enough, right? Yeah, yeah. Enough, just had enough fun yeah. for one time. So that was that was pretty neat. I want to stop for a second and see if Ed Sue have any questions. I think I'm good. Okay. No, I'm fine. Okay. Okay, I have a closing remark too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, before you do that, okay. I, I just want to thank you for coming here and doing this. I mean, I think we'll all agree this is one of the more fascinating stories we've heard, and we've done a lot of interviews. I mean, you, you had a great foundation with your parents. Your father served in World War II and your mother was a Rosie the Riveter and you took her ROTC and you went into the service and you were, I know you're not going to agree with this, but I would consider what you did as heroic. I mean, you, you were putting your life on the line every time you went up because you were going into, in effect, enemy territory because somebody had been hurt. Mm -hmm. And you just kept going back and going back and doing what you had to do. And uh, I, I know I'm impressed with your bravery and your skills. I mean, you were obviously a skilled pilot. And Thank you. I, I just can't tell you how much we appreciate you coming in, mm -hmm. in here and appreciate what you did for, mm -hmm. for our country. And I would like to give you a chance to just say anything else you would like okay. to say in closing. Yeah, I thought about it. One on the. Uh, information that Sue sent, mm -hmm. said that, you know, that I could do a final remark. And so I thought, well, what, what mm -hmm. would I say? You know, a special mission or something special. And the thing that, that came to mind, and this was a case on, a chaplain came up and gave me this uh, steel cross painted black. And he said, this is you know, to remind you of who's taking care of you and um, just to keep you safe. And so uh, I kept that through the the rest of the war. And after that, I, I put yeah. it in my jewelry box and kept it. And uh, I really felt that there was God's hands around me. Yeah. Yeah. There are just uh, so many things that, that I, I couldn't have gotten away with without help. <clears throat> so I met a, a young man that was a medic in uh, Iraq. So I gave him that cross. Oh, good. Good. And uh, I hope he. He used it well. Well, that's a, another testament to the type of person you are. That. And I appreciate this opportunity to, to tell my story. Well, you know, Bob Babcock's just shamed us into coming <laughs> down here and telling no, our story. Bob don't do that. 
Yeah, so Bob did that, and then Sue encouraged us, and so uh, you know, she she asked every meeting, and so I finally said, oh, I, there's no reason I can't. So. Well, we're glad, glad you came. Um, we both, all three of us, fascinated by hearing your story, and want to thank you again for your service. No, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. For Thanks coming. for your support.